Hello, hello. So I'm originally from Laplace, and I still live in like the Gramercy area. Oh, sure, no problem. I'm, I can be loud, so that's not a problem. <laughs> I'm originally from Laplace. Um, I still live in the local area. I live in uh, Gramercy, Louisiana currently. I practice endocrinology, as she said, and my talk is about type 2 diabetes 101. So the plan or the goal is that you leave here knowing something about diabetes that you may not have known when you walked through the door. Okay, so basic information, and at the end we'll have time for questions. Um, so enjoy the talk. This is a brief outline of what the talk will consist of. We'll briefly talk about the history of diabetes, why is it significant for us, how does it work or develop in each patient, what are some risk factors that can preclude you to getting screened for diabetes at a sooner time, how does it present, what are the signs and symptoms that you may experience with diabetes before you're diagnosed, how do we diagnose it, what are the complications, and how do we treat, or what are our goals for treatment. So starting with the history, diabetes is a disease that was um, initially based upon symptoms alone. So the ancient Egyptians back in 1500 BC noted, a, you can come in, noted a group of patients who all experienced similar symptoms a few months or weeks before they passed, right? These patients passed large amounts of urine, had significant weight loss, and then a few weeks they were deceased. So they coined that term as diabetes mellitus. We say DM for short or diabetes for short, but the, the formal name is diabetes mellitus. And diabetes means to siphon or to pass. So think about it, these patients passed large amounts of urine before they died. And the Latin origin for mellitus actually means honey or sweet. So putting it together, these patients passed large amounts of sweet, honey smelling urine before they passed. Initially, so for our time, it was diagnosed or coined in the 1800s in the New England Journal of Medicine and Surgery. But at that time, when they d grouped it as a disease or a disorder, we didn't really know how it worked and we didn't have any treatment. So we would label you with diabetes and then within a few weeks to months, these patients would all be deceased. So why is it important for us today? In the US, anywhere from 6 to 13% of Americans have diabetes, and specifically for Louisiana, over half a million people have the diagnosis of, di of diabetes. That's around 13, 14%. There's over 100,000 people who have the condition, and they aren't even diagnosed, and about 1.3 million people have pre-diabetes, which is a condition that kind of precludes or comes before the actual diagnosis of diabetes. Every year, about 30,000 people are diagnosed with diabetes in Louisiana alone. So it's super important that we get the word out or that we educate ourselves on what it means to have diabetes or what's the signs that maybe I need to be screened sooner. Of course, in Louisiana, we're usually the top for the categories we don't want to be the top for, right? <laughs> um, so here, the green line, so the difference between the green and the blue are just years. The green portion is just 2011 and on, right? So if you look at the last dot, we're about 14%, while the rest of the country is around 11% as far as diagnosis for diabetes or prevalence of diabetes. Um, and what that means for us is we're one of the worst states or the unhealthiest states uh, in the country. We're actually not the worst. Kudos for us, West Virginia is the worst, um, but Colorado is actually the healthiest state with the least amount of diabetes. <laughs> so what do we look for? The fancy term is called microvascular or macrovascular complications, but making it plain and simple, there are small vessels in the body that we want to screen for because they are injured with diabetes, and there are also large vessels, right? So that's where micro and macrovascular complications come from. When it comes to microvascular or small vessel disease, we're going to be concerned about the nerves that are the vessels that feed the eye. We're gonna be concerned about the nerves or the vessels that feed the nerves. And we're gonna make sure we monitor and screen the vessels that feed the kidney because those come with complications within themselves. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, there are large vessels that are injured with diabetes, the vessels that feed the heart, right? So heart disease or heart attack. The vessels that feed the brain. So we wanna make sure that we're optimizing our sugar levels because we don't want stroke. We don't want the uh, mini strokes, TIAs, right? Um, and then there are also large vessels that feed your limbs in, in general. So some patients with diabetes have poor circulation. You'll notice that they're more prone to wounds on their feet or the lower parts of their leg. So that's why we're screening and that's why we're trying to optimize your glucose levels up front to prevent these complications on the back end. Diabetes is a chronic condition, meaning 
When you get diagnosed with diabetes, you have it until the time you pass. It doesn't mean you have to pass from diabetes, but it is something that needs to be managed lifelong, right? And the importance of it is if we can control your sugars up front, you are less likely to experience complications on the back end. So how does diabetes work or where does diabetes come from? You can either not make insulin, those are your type one diabetics, their pancreas just doesn't produce it for one reason or another, or you can make insulin, but your body is just resistant to insulin's effect for one reason or another. And there are a group of patients who have a combination of the two. So you're looking at your type two diabetics who were poorly controlled over a long period of time and now their pancreas is kind of like, I'm overworked, I'm underpaid, I'm not making any more insulin any longer, right? Those are your combination type of diabetics. So where does it come from? Is it genetic? Is the environment? Is it just because I live in Louisiana? Well, it's a little bit of both, right? Some people have a family history of diabetes, which makes you more prone to being diagnosed with diabetes. If you live in Southern Louisiana, your environment, your lifestyle, you're exposed to certain foods that may aggravate or trigger your diabetes as well. So it's a combination. We say multifactorial, meaning that it could be a number of different reasons that kind of contribute to the development of diabetes. So pathophysiology just means how does the body work or where does it come from, right? So for diabetes in general, when we eat, our food is broken down usually into glucose or carbohydrates, and then that is turned into glucose or turned into sugar. And then the sugar is the basic form of energy that all of our cells use, right? So it's important that our body be exposed to certain carbs or healthier carbs and healthier sugars because we need that for energy or to fuel all the cells of the body. Insulin is the hormone that helps or allows each of those cells to actually use glucose as energy. So together, they're all really important. If you think about it, or making this, allowing this to make the most sense, think about insulin as the key to certain doors of certain cells, all right? And then insulin will unlock the door and allow glucose to enter so the cell can use it for energy. Basic, con basic kind of uh, concept. There are some, some cells that have a lock, so the door on the right, and then there are some cells that don't have a lock, right? So some cells need insulin and others do not. Think about the cells that you don't want to rely on insulin to use for energy, your brain. You want your brain to be able to use glucose at will to kind of keep you going, keep you thinking. Um, your red blood cells and your liver also do not require insulin to use glucose for energy. So those cells are important and they don't rely on you being insulin resistant or not, right? Imagine if a diabetic patient had to utilize or keep their insulin levels normal in order to think. We don't want it that way. But then there are also some cells that require insulin to unlock the door to be able to use glucose for energy. Those cells are your muscle cells and your fat cells. So the more you exercise, you upregulate those doors that insulin can open to use for energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So in diabetes, there's a problem with the lock and key system. Even though your key is for the lock, for some reason or another, your key just doesn't work as well. So your body makes more keys to hopefully allow one of them to open the door for cells to be able to be used. Does that make sense? That's where insulin resistance comes from. That's where your type two diabetes comes from. It's not that you don't have the keys, it's just that they're not really working well when it gets to the door. Does that make sense? Okay. So this leads to a lack of doors opening and then sugar remains in the bloodstream, right? If you can't get it into the cells, if you can't get it through the door, then it just sits in your bloodstream and then your blood sugar levels rise and rise and rise. So within the endocrine system, there are always checks and balances. So the checks and balance for insulin is the hormone called glucagon. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin, right? So I'm just gonna walk up here because I can't stay back here forever. But if you think about high blood sugar levels, the high blood sugar levels will stimulate your pancreas to secrete insulin because you're trying to open doors and lower your blood sugar level. But eventually, you'll get to a point where you don't want it to get any lower, right? You don't want to be hypoglycemic or your sugars to be too low. That's when the same organ will turn on glucagon. Glucagon will allow the liver to release sugar into your blood to prevent you from becoming hypoglycemic. And then it'll ultimately raise your blood sugar. So think about it this way. When you're asleep, your body is actually releasing sugar from the liver because we don't want insulin to overrun 
or drive your blood sugars down, right? So when you're asleep, usually glucagon is working the best. And then you wake up and your insulin levels are trying to help control those elevated levels throughout the rest of the day. Does that kind of make sense? So it's like checks and balance. Now, I try to make it as simple as possible, but of course, it's always gonna be much more complicated than that because beyond just the pancreas, there are several organs within the body that help to normalize or control your blood sugar levels, right? From your stomach when you eat, from your liver while you're asleep, from your brain telling you that you're hungry or you're full, all of these organs work together in efforts to control or normalize your blood sugar level. Specifically in your digestive system. Now, I just want you to kind of keep it in the back of your mind. You don't have to memorize this by any means, but if you understand that different organs are working, then it'll make sense when we get to the treatment side why certain medications, in my opinion, are better than others, okay? So in your stomach, when you eat, your stomach releases a hormone called GLP-1. It tells your brain basically that you're full. It reduces your appetite as you're eating. In the body, when you naturally produce this GLP-1 hormone, at some point you don't wanna be full forever, right? Your body wants to get more energy in later on in the day. So there's an enzyme or a machinery, a group of machinery that helps to degrade or break it down or remove it from the system. That's DPP-4, right? So together, GLP-1 tells, you, tells your brain, I'm full. DPP-4 reduces that message so you can get hungry again to eat. So that's kind of how the stomach plays into this part of diabetes. Of course, GLP-1 can do a whole bunch of different things. It talks to the brain, it talks to your heart because it can protect your heart important piece for this puzzle and it also tells your muscles to make more of those doors right which allows you to be more insulin sensitive because if you have more doors then your key has a better chance of working so this medication in my opinion is one of the best or there's a medication that targets this pathway it's one of the best because it works on several different areas or aspects within the body another player that we may not often think about are your kidneys so your kidneys are responsible for filtering out your, your blood in general, right? And when your blood sugar levels are high, it's filtering out large amounts of blood sugar, or it's trying to. And normally, your kidneys want to hold on to sugar because you're not designed to urinate or pee out calories, right? You're designed to hold on to calories for energy. But at a certain threshold, your kidneys realize that whatever's going on the back end, going on on the back end, it's trying to help you or fix it. And that's when you urinate or pee out large amounts of sugar. There are channels within the kidney that help you reclaim or hold on to sugar that was filtered from your blood. That's a fancy talk. The channel's name, fancy talk, is SGLT2, but just realize that the kidneys are involved in filtering out sugar as well as holding on to sugar if you need to. There are the muscles we know have the doors that take in sugar. Your fat cells actually are a component or a proponent of insulin resistant resistance. So if you've ever heard of a person who said, I didn't really become diabetic until I gained so much weight, right? It's because your fat cells worsen or contribute to your insulin resistance. So overall, all these organs are working together or against each other in the system of uh, development of diabetes. So who exactly gets diabetes is really hard to say, but we can tell you who's at risk. Any non-white um, person is at increased risk for diabetes. So African-Americans, Hispanic, Asian-Americans, Alaskan-Americans are all at risk for diabetes. If you've been diagnosed with pre-diabetes, right, the condition that comes before, you are also at risk for developing, I don't wanna say full-blown diabetes, but overt diabetes, right? And the same goes for women who, when you were pregnant, you were diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Gestational means pregnant or while pregnant. So some women, only during those nine months of carrying a child, have blood sugar levels that will classify them as di being a diabetic. So while you're pregnant, some women get treated for diabetes, but the minute they de deliver the child, their blood sugar levels come back to normal. Well, because you have this period of time in your life where your sugars are uncontrolled, it increases your risk later on in the future. If you're overweight, but we talked about that, right? Fat cells make you more insulin resistant. So if you're overweight, you're at increased risk of diabetes. And just the older you get, the older we get, the worse those keys work in general, right? So age is a risk factor for diabetes. 
if you have a family history of diabetes, so if it's in your genetics, you're at risk for diabetes, as well as if you're not really the most active, right? Because if you're not very active, then you don't increase the number of doors on the muscle side, so you are likely to have keys that do not work. Does that make sense? Okay. So once you're diagnosed with diabetes, or those who have diabetes, what does it mean? Well, out of all the people who have diabetes, type two is the most common. About 90% of all those diagnosed with diabetes actually have type two diabetes. It used to be a disease or a condition of the old, right? The older we got, the more likely we were to become diabetic. You can come in. But what we're finding nowadays is that with the increase of juvenile obesity, again, fat cells worsen your insulin resistance, we're diagnosing kids and teens and adolescents with diabetes at a younger age than we've ever seen before. But remember, these cells, they just don't respond to insulin. So now there's a new group of patients that we're focusing our energy and efforts on, those who are insulin resistant. So let me take a step back. On a spectrum, you're gonna have those who handle their blood sugars well or normally. You're gonna have those who are diabetic and they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. And within the spectrum, you have those who are insulin resistant, those who are pre-diabetic, right? So normal, insulin resistant, pre-diabetic, and diabetes in that order. Those who are insulin resistant, you have already shown signs that your body has to put out more keys or more insulin to keep your blood sugar levels normal. Those are your insulin resistant patients, right? Not the same as being pre-diabetic. So when you're pre-diabetic, not only are you making more keys or producing more insulin, but in spite of those efforts, your blood sugar levels now are higher than a normal person's blood sugar level. So in the 120s, in the 1 teens, kind of consistently throughout the day and in the morning, that's pre-diabetic. And then on the far end, in spite of you having all these keys, in spite of you making as much insulin as you could possibly produce, your blood sugar levels are still through the roof without the assistance of medication. Does that make sense? Okay. So what are the signs and symptoms? Well, if you can think about all these organs that are playing a part in diabetes and c controlling your sugars, then it can make sense as to what symptoms you're experiencing. So here, I don't know if you can see this mouse. I'm just gonna walk up again. So here, you're gonna have frequent urination, but that makes sense because your kidneys are working to filter out all this excess blood sugar. Along with frequent urination or excessive sh production of sugar in your urine, water has to follow to help you get rid of this, right? So not only will you have frequent urination, but you're gonna be extremely thirsty or extremely dehydrated. Those two play a part or, or work together. When your levels are that high, it's almost like your blood becomes syrup, for lack of better terms, right? But if you have a lot of sugar in your blood, your blood is thicker than normal, more syrupy than normal. So the cells that usually go to wounds or cuts can't get there as quickly as they used to. So now you have inability or difficulty healing from simple cuts or scratches. There are people who have blurry vision. I'm, here it goes. People with blurry vision when your sugars are high, that's because when your sugar levels are elevated, it changes the function of the lens in your eye, right? Your lenses or your eyes are really sensitive to water. Have you ever had dry eye, itchy eye, and you're like, what's going on? Well, the opposite happens when your blood sugar levels are high. And because you get that change in the shape of the lens of your eye, then your vision becomes blurry. Men, I don't know if any guys are here, men in the room, have sexual problems when it comes to diabetes. Because if you think about it, if you can affect the nerves of your feet and fingers and toes, the nerves of your eyes, you actually affect the nerves that innervate just about all kinds of parts of your body, right? And men have sexual dysfunction when it comes to diabetes, erectile dysfunction, and not anything that they've done for themselves, but if it can affect the vessels of your legs, it can affect the nerves of your feet, then it can affect the nerves and vessels of the parts that are most important to men. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For women, think about this. If you're urinating large amounts of sugar, that's a really nutrient-rich fluid, right? And if you constantly pass that near your, your, your urinary system, it increases your risk for urinary tract infections and vaginal like yeast infections, right? But it just makes sense. You have a nutrient-rich substance that's constantly being exposed to a specific area. So what are the criteria for diabetes? One of four different things. You can come in. No problem. So any, <laughs> any random blood sugar above 200 with those signs and symptoms 
can classify you as diabetes, right? So if you check your sugar any random time of day, even after a meal, because it shouldn't get higher than 200 after a meal. So if your blood sugar level is 200, you're having frequent urinations randomly during the day, you're getting blurry vision, you're trying to figure out why do I constantly get urinary tract infections, maybe you have diabetes. If you wake up, you can come in, if you wake up in the morning and your fasting blood sugar is greater than 126, that can classify you as diabetes, right? Your A1C, A1C is a marker for diabetes over the course of three months. And I'll tell you a funny story. Back in the day, I say back in the day, but back in the day, patients with diabetes, before they would see their doctor, like the week or two weeks before they would see their doctor, they would try to do everything right, right? I'm gonna eat the right foods, I'm gonna make sure my numbers come down, because when I see my doctor, I don't want him or her to tell me, you're not doing this right, you need to change this, we need more insulin, et cetera. Well, A1C kind of bypassed that, right? A1C tells me what your sugars have been like over the course of three months. So even if you get your sugars together in a week, I know you have not been doing the right thing over the last couple of months, right? And then there's a test where you actually drink a, a measured amount of carbs, and then we check your sugar levels at one hour and two hours. If at the two hour mark, you're above 200, that can classify you as diabetic. So here's the thing. If there are four markers that can tell me that you're diabetic, if I use one of them alone, I am doing a disservice to you because we're all allowed to have bad days, right? So what I do in clinic is I want you to have two of these, one of these four twice on separate occasions. Let's take out the, the variable that maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you had king cake before you came to see me and that's why your blood sugars are in the 200. Okay, that's a bad day. But if this happens on more than one occasion, any one of the four, then I classify my patients as being diabetic. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's important for me to not misdiagnose a person with diabetes because the minute I give you this diagnosis or the minute I put this label in your chart, you're stuck with it forever, right? So if I do that, we are worried about the microvascular and macrovascular complications. So small vessel disease complications and large vessel disease complications. So if I label you as diabetic, then I know I have to address all of these issues. And with addressing these issues comes a number of different medications associated with that. So for microvascular disease one, now I'm telling you, because you have diabetes, we, gotta, we have to have your eye exam every year. And this is not your normal eye exam. You need to tell the, the person that's doing your eye exam that I have diabetes and I want a diabetic eye exam. Because what they'll do is they'll dilate your eyes and actually look at the retina in the back to make sure you're not having any of these vascular complications. Because your vision can look completely normal but they can find the disease in the back of the eye. So every year, now you have to get an eye exam. In addition to that, because there are microvascular or small vessel diseases to the nerves of your hands and feet, now I'm requiring you to have a foot exam every year. And this is not, oh, let me look at your feet, your toes look great, I love that polish. This is, can you sense very fine touch? If I put a tuning fork on your ankle, and it vibrates, can you feel it, right? That's important because that tells me how sensitive your nerves are, how likely you are to have complications or sores or wounds from wearing the wrong shoe and not really even know it. So I tell my patients, you, you have diabetes now, even if your feet are quote normal, you say you can feel everything before you put your shoes on, let's make sure they don't have any rocks or stones or pebbles. When you take them off, let's look at your ankles, your toes, because you don't want any blisters or sores, right? You wanna address them up front if not. So that's why it's super important that I not only you get your yearly foot exam, but you're checking your shoes, your feet kind of frequently throughout the, throughout the month. Can I ask you, something? you sure can. There are different kinds of foot doctors. Well, it depends on what you need. So if you are, or if you have diabetes, and let's say you want your nails trimmed, do not go to the nail shop, right? They will do you a disservice with diabetes and going to the nail shop because if you get these micro cuts and tears in that nasty water, you're already at increased risk for infection. You're already at increased risk for poor wound healing. I tell all my patients with diabetes, if you need your nails trimmed, you want your cuticles fixed, then you go to a podiatrist, someone who manages or handles feet on a regular and can, can appropriately address a diabetic's foot complaint. I do foot exams in clinic, but I don't do the foot treatments in clinic, right? So as long as you're going to a podiatrist, it's more than enough, okay? You're welcome. So microvascular complications, we have to protect your kidneys. 
So there's a specific medication, if you've heard of lisinopril, bonazepril, if you've heard of losartan, herbosartan, all those medications are designed to protect the kidney. So now with this diagnosis, you have to have a, an eye exam, you have to get a foot exam, and now I'm putting you on a new medication to protect your kidneys. That's actually designed for blood pressure, but we found in diabetics, it actually prevents them from having, we say renal, renal means kidney complications down the line. Yeah, go ahead. or whether you're not producing enough insulin. The basic problem. Yes. You, is, are there tests to determine that? There are tests to determine that. Um, what we do in uh, our system at Women's is there's an oral glucose tolerance test that we order that actually measures blood sugar levels and insulin levels together. We pair those to, oh really? We pair those to see uh, how you respond I'm a to a carb load. I'll come back to that at the end because now I only have five minutes to finish this talk and we're not nearly to the end. You do have a question. Okay. Um, macrovas so I'm sorry, but I'm going to run through the rest of this. I really apologize. But macrovascular complications, heart disease and stroke, right? How do we prevent that? We put everyone on a cholesterol pill. If you're above the age of 40 with diabetes, you should be on a, quote, statin, a torvastatin, rosuvastatin. Paravastatin, simvastatin, you should be on something to help control your cholesterol, specifically Lipitor, Crestor, those are the best when it comes to diabetes, but as long as you're taking that before bed every night, you're protecting yourself from heart disease and stroke in the future. So if we know all these organs work together to control or worsen your blood sugar levels, then if we target these, these organs, maybe we can help improve your blood sugar levels. This is to just show you that the goal for your A1C once you're diagnosed with diabetes is less than seven. Why do we pick that number? Because there's several different studies as you see here that have shown us when you're less than seven, you're less likely to have risk or complications in the future, okay? So what what's the best medication for diabetes? Nothing beats diet and exercise, right? But we live in Southern Louisiana. So how do we get diet and exercise together to help control our sugars? I tell my patients in general, if you can avoid starches for the most part, your starches are like carb loads and they're processed, they're not natural. So your body's working for a long period of time to break these foods down. So you're being exposed to elevated blood sugar levels over hours at a time, right? So we can minimize your starches. You'll still get carbs in your vegetables. You'll still get carbs in your fruit, but fruit is in portion, portion size, right? You can't eat the whole container of grapes. But as long as you're doing this in portion, con portion, portion controlled, your diet and exercise can really help you go a long way. When patients ask what kind of diet should I do or how much, my, many carbs should I have, you're doing a low carb diet. So as long as your meals are anywhere from 15 to 30 grams of carbs, now mind you that's not a lot of carbs, but each meal is 15 to 30 grams of carbs and your snacks are less than 15 grams of carbs, you're well on your way in trying to control your blood sugar levels. Drinks, don't drink your calories. Why would you ever drink your calories when you can eat them? So drink water, drink crystal light, sprinkle some Splenda here and there. Now some people are worried that Splenda causes cancer, different conversation. When it comes to diabetes, if you can drink water, water substitutes, sparkling water, all that will take you a long way. Don't drink a soda. Please, if you don't learn anything from me, if you have diabetes, do not drink regular soda. It, it's a waste of calories and space. Exercise. The target time is 150 to 200 minutes a week. But again, the reason for that is you're upregulating the doors in the muscle. So if you have more doors that are able to open and take in sugar, you can lower your blood sugar levels on the back end. All right? If you set a goal today of 5 to 7% of weight loss, your sugars will come down. It, it may or may not make you normal because I don't know where your starting point is, right? But it will help control your sugars tremendously. And then there are medications. I think of medications like cars. I'm not a car person, but I drove a Corolla, right? In high school, I had a 2005 or four Corolla, and now the 2020 Corollas look completely different from the car that I used to drive. So think about insulin and your sulfonylureas as like your 1990 Corollas. There's no power window, there's no power lock. You're rolling the window down. It still gets you to where you want to go, but it's not the most convenient. Does that make sense? So insulin. I'm sorry? Uh, how long <laughs> <laughs> Insulin is 
it, it's great, right? It's more keys. It's giving your body more keys to help lower those blood sugar levels. And no matter what you do, there'll be more keys around. So the risk with insulin is weight, is hypoglycemia or low blood sugars, right? Because we've just opened all kinds of doors to get your blood sugar levels lower. But the side effect with insulin is when your insulin levels are high, your body also, instead of letting sugar into the cells, it also packages your sugars into fat and stores it in all kinds of other places. So that's why people who are insulin resistant have a really hard time losing weight because not only are you making sure sugar goes into the right cells, but you're packaging them inappropriately and now patients are getting weight gain when they're on insulin. The same thing for sulfonylureas. You would think that if I give you a medicine that makes you secrete more insulin, it's better for you, but if there's more insulin around, there's more weight gain, right? If there's more insulin around, there's more of a chance for hypoglycemia or low blood sugar levels. So yeah, they work, but as a woman, I don't need more fat around anywhere. That's working on your pancreas level. Metformin is probably the staple medication for diabetes in general. Everyone who's pre-diabetic, insulin resistant, diabe diabetic in general, likely they're on metformin because it's a great drug. The worst of the side effects or GI upset. We were talking about this earlier. Diarrhea, crampiness, bloatiness, but there are ways to avoid it. If you clean your diet, likely you're not gonna have some of those complications, right? Because it's how metformin is helping you that causes the side effects. Um, we talk about how it's prescribed. If you do the slow release medication versus the immediate release, you're less likely to experience the complications. But think about metformin as your insulin sensitizer. So it doesn't create more doors, it just makes the lock a little bit larger, so any key in general may work to open the door. Does that make sense? Can you give me one second, because I'm running out of time. Um, there was recent question about metformin and cancer. The FDA has debunked that theory. Uh, metformin had a, a, a chemical in it, NDMA, that was worried, or there was some association with cancer, but that has been debunked. FDA has investigated uh, metformin kind of thoroughly. They checked 10 different formulations of metformin. Only 10 were found to have this chemical. I mean, two were found to have this chemical, and of the two, they were so low that it really didn't make any difference. So we can prescribe metformin kind of freely without worrying about, am I getting cancer? Again, working at the liver level and at the muscular level. And it's just about time for questions. I'm almost done. This is your GLP-1, that hormone that came from the gut. Now we can actually give you that hormone. The downside effect of this is that it's an injection. Some people hate needles, right? But beyond that, it's once a week. Why would I not give you something that, that you can take once a week to kind of help control your sugar levels versus doing something every day or multiple times a day? And then if you can't tolerate the injection, there's a medication, the DPP-4 inhib inhibitor like Genuvia. Genuvia is that machinery, remember we talked about preventing or breaking down that hormone in the stomach? Well, now we can give you a drug that prevents the breakdown of your natural GLP-1. Not as great as giving you GLP-1 in general, right? But it's still better than nothing at all. So your GLP-1s, your Ozempic, your Trulicity, your Victoza, those are golden medications for diabetes. Genuvia, not as great as the three mentioned before, but still a great option. Side of Genuvia, Trigenta, um, Janumet, Janumet is Genuvia mixed with metformin, so there are a lot of combo pills nowadays, but that's, the two are the staples. Again, working on your brain, telling you you're full, slowing your appetite, making you fuller sooner, less likely to snack. When you're on these medications, your only job is to put the right foods in, because when you put a little bit in, you're full and you don't want much more. Side effect, which is not really a side effect, is weight loss out of the wazoo. Right? I have patients right now in Ozempic who have lost 15, 20 pounds, um, and it's because it's controlling your appetite. It's, it's watching how you absorb the carbs. It's lowering your blood sugar level and optimizing your insulin levels. And then the l one of the last ones, this will probably be the last one I do before we stop for questions, SGLT2 inhibitors. We talked about the kidney reabsorbing sugar. Well, we just kind of tricked the kidney, and we said, from here on out, you're not absorbing any more sugar. Whatever you see, just get rid of it, right? So now this medication causes you to urinate out large volumes of sugar. Also optimizing how your blood sugar levels are and because you're peeing out calories, you get weight loss as the back, of, back end effect. The side effect is remember, if you pee out sugar, you're gonna lose a whole lot of water. So you can really be uh, dehydrated. IVVD means dehydration. It's fancy talk for dehydration. So when you're on this medication, make sure you're drinking plenty of water. Make sure you have normal kind of genital hygiene because a nutrient-rich substance can increase your risk for urinary tract infections or yeast infections. 
And then the other medications left are not as great, so they don't really matter as much. Give you nasty side effects, weight gain, heart failure, fecal incontinence. Nobody wants any of that, so you probably haven't seen a carbose or peoclitazone. And here's the kicker, right? In a perfect world, I'd have everyone on GLP-1s. I'd have everyone on SGLT-2 inhibitors, but every month it's costing my patients $1,000 a month, right? So if you don't have insurance to cover this, this is a mute point. So you will have patients who are on your sulfonylureas, right? Even though it's not the best drug, you'll have patients on insulin, even though it may not be the best option, but physicians are put into a position where we're, we're left to choose between the cost of doing what's right versus the best choice for the patient. And we're just working in the system that we have to give you the best care. So sometimes you'll be on a sulfonylurea and then sometimes you may be on a GLP-1 inhibitor, right? But it really depends on what your insurance will allow us to prescribe. Yes, I don't even know how insurance became the doctors of the 21st century, but they're dictating and determining what we do for our patients. So at the end of the day, we're working within the boundaries that's best for you guys. But as a diabetic, if any of you have diabetes, your goal is to hold on to what motivates you to do the right thing. And when you find that motivation, don't let go of it because it will drive you to get your sugars under control and your weight under control. I'm very passionate about diabetes. My motivation initially came from my stepdad because he's a type two diabetic who had a risk of like amputations and loss of limb as a, a child. But now my motivation are my babies. So, um, these are my references, and I don't know how much time we have left for questions, but you guys, please ask all the questions you want.